some of which are what you might call industry standards. If we want to have this recognised anywhere, you need to comply to, essentially. So that's the way I'll be framing it. But I think there'll be some huge differences to what I would normally... Yeah, there's going to be some differences to how this course will run. And I think we'll get into that at the end. Left a bucket at the end, which we'll have a kind of open conversation on. I want it to be normally. I've worked within the restrictions of an educational institution, like a um, university, essentially. And there are no rules here. So we'll be able to do things that you wouldn't be able to do in an institution. What does that look like? Yeah, there's just a bunch of different restrictions because you're essentially you have to accommodate the needs of many different types of students and they're all paying a lot of money for it so when you know the last courses i was responsible for overseeing were i was at the i'll, I'll go into a bit of my background at the beginning give people a bit of context where this is coming from <clears throat> but the last course I was validating were at the London College of Fashion. That was my last position as an associate dean. And about 50% of our students were international. And they were paying something around £20,000 a year. So it's an expensive deal. And people's entire futures reside on these things. So there's a lot of like quality assurance and regulation around it so yeah it's that creates a lot of complexity you have to fit in with a lot of national standards we won't be bound to a particular nation state's rules if you like so that gives us a little bit more play we'll be digitally native so we'll be closer to a mooc a massive open online course than a conventional conventional setup we'll have different kinds of pedagogy because we're dealing with a bunch of pseudonymous people in a DAO. Pedagogy is the kind of science of teaching. It's, yeah, pedagogy is the kind of, what's the teaching practice? There's, again, a bit of a, there's, te there's andragogy, sometimes called, which is like adult learning. Pedagogy typically mean, refers to young learners. It's become a capital term for almost any kind of learning. But yeah, learning and teaching is going to be different. Well, is there tools that we can use in... Uh, Discord and places like this, which will be new. What kind of assessment methods we can do? Can we use our voting tools? I think there's all sorts of stuff that we can experiment with. It's going to be quite interesting. Yeah, can you set up? Yeah, set up. the Shibakus can be part of our assessment framework. It's going to be wild. It's going to be interesting. But yeah, I've got a bunch of question, hanging questions on. I thought about doing this a while ago, but what put me off it was the, the amount of work it's going to take. We've got to be able to be sure that we can do it. And we need to be able to see if we've got a sufficient amount of interest to do it. It's going to be costly to us. So is there enough people who want to do it? Is there enough demand? I don't know. I don't know. We might want to experiment with that in the new year and see what the see what the kickoff percentage is. I'll, yeah, we can talk about that at the end. I think there's enough people. Just, I'd try and wrap up at half five at the latest, like an hour and a half. So I'm, I'm going to dive in in a minute. You recording, Matt? Okie dokie. All right, I'm going to share my screen and dive into a little bit of curriculum design. I will say this is the start of this. Can everyone see my screen? It says Masters in Dow Leadership. So just by way of an introduction, this is an idea I've been mulling around with for a long time. It's actually one of the first things I wanted to do in crypto. I'm an educationalist by background, I guess you could say. So a little bit of background on me and my sort of history before hitting the crypto space. I spent about 10 years in physics. So I, I did my undergraduate degree in physics. I did a master's in biophysics, which turned into a PhD in a subfield called surface science. And that was about understanding how biological molecules ordered on surfaces where most of the interesting stuff happens in biological systems. And as an, so I spent about four or five years as an experimental physicist. 
And throughout that period of time, I did a lot of teaching. And I started to realize that I was not an experimental physicist. That's a particular type of person. You have to be very methodical. You need to keep perfect log books. You need the patience to be able to run the same experiment a hundred times. And you end up spending a lot of your time in certainly the field that I ended up with, a lot of time in the lab, firing lasers at things and what have you. And in order to survive, really, because you got a stipend, I was lucky enough to be paid, essentially, to, to do my studying. But there wasn't a lot of money. And the way I survived was by doing teaching, tutoring, science outreach, things like that. I used to go to schools all around the Liverpool area in the UK and take vats of liquid nitrogen and explain thermodynamics to kids, things like that. And that's where I fell in love with education. And so I ended up leaving physics to go and take up a lectureship in mathematics, another Liverpool university place called Liverpool Hope, which had a very, it was one of the oldest education departments in the country. And I ended up drifting from maths to maths education. It was maths where I discovered cryptography, which is where I got um, interested in Bitcoin and, and, and discovered crypto through that route. And over the course of about a decade, I ended up becoming more and more involved in the sort of senior leadership of designing educational systems. And I ended up for about three years running the education courses at that university at the master's level. <clears throat> so I was at one point running about 16 master's courses in education. And I ended up redesigning the whole master's portfolio there and worked with some, some really talented educators. And I learned a lot of education theory, curriculum design, ended up teaching education and curriculum design, running courses, ended up teaching thousands of teachers from the Liverpool area in, in learning teaching, which is a kind of subfield of all that sort of stuff. And eventually... All that stuff went really well, reformed a, a master's suite of courses, and I ended up getting, a, getting to the position of director of learning and teaching at that institution. And then eventually I got, I'd been in Liverpool for about 17 years at that point, and I was just at a point in my life where I thought, maybe I'll do something different. Do I want to stay doing this forever up north in, in the UK? And out of the blue, I got email from the London College of Fashion, which was weird. And it was a recruiter, a kind of headhunter, who'd seen some of the work that I'd been doing at, at that university, which actually involved the creation of a decentralized organization structure. And we'd won some awards for this, and that got me on the radar of that institution, and I ended up applying for a job as an associate dean there. And they, I got it. And in somewhere around 2017, I moved down to London. And by this point, I was completely obsessed on crypto. I'd watched the Dow be born and explode in a ball of flames. And, but the, the idea had got into my mind and I couldn't get it out. And the first thing I did when I went and did a bit of traveling in 2017 and around sort of Europe and Eastern Europe, and I landed with a bag. I burned all my clothes. Basically, I had nothing in the world apart from a rucksack, <laughs> which I landed in London with. And yeah, I first thing I did was went to a crypto meetup in London, and I just basically ended up juggling this job as an associate dean, and essentially moonlighting in the crypto space, working with a bunch of crypto startups, working in token economics. And imagining how I would eventually transition out of academia and end up in, in crypto. And that, that took me like three and a half years. And that's eventually I ended up jumping out of academia into, into finance.vote during sort of DeFi summer. 
And but one of the ideas that I'd been how do I get how do I get into crypto? How do I just end up in this industry full time? And one of the things I wanted to do was essentially set up a a startup that would do educational stuff in crypto, teach people what I essentially had research. I'd done more research in blockchain than I did in my PhD by about 2018. And so I was down. And I thought, I want to be able to be in a position where I can educate people more about this. I think it's going to be huge. And yeah, I thought about setting up a startup that would ultimately aim to be a kind of free university. That There's like these, this notion of free schools and there's like independent the government there at that time was starting to encourage people to move into the higher education market to do specific courses. And I wanted to do one of these things. So I've been thinking about this course for a long time. I was always going to return to it. I wasn't necessarily expecting to do it this year, but here we are. So that's the background of me and why we're here and talking about this. And most of what I did in that job as an associate dean, as a director of learning and teaching, was help academics develop their courses. And I would say I've sat in validation committees, which is the kind of process for signing off that these are compliant courses, if you like. I must have sat in 200 of these things. I've seen the birth and formation and delivery of hundreds of master's courses and undergraduate courses. So it's the thing I probably know more about than even crypto. And yeah, so what I plan on doing here is whizzing through and and do jump in at any point if you want to ask any questions or jump in with any comments or anything but yeah i'll I'll just pause here actually has anyone got any questions about anything i've said so far about what i've been talking about all right i'll jump into where we're going at here the basic structure of any course normally the the way that somewhere around the 80s we realized that education is there needs to be some kind of standardization of being able to monitor whether a course is doing a good job or not. So academics are pretty difficult customers to to keep under control. If you go into education and academia, you're doing so because you don't really want to go into the corporate world. And the academic bubble is an interesting environment to work in. But they're unmanageable creatures, these people, specifically people who are very much hard into their research. It's people who want to get very deep into a discipline and stay in it for a life, a lifetime's work. And sometimes they do a really good job of teaching their discipline. Sometimes they do a terrible job. And there wasn't a whole lot of people going to universities, even in the UK, in, in sort of the 80s and early 90s. And there was a real desire from the state level to try and get more people doing education. And they called it the massification of higher education. It was a kind of a very fairly elite thing to do for a long time. And eventually realized, okay, what we need to do is find out a way of structuring courses so we can find out if people are doing this properly. And the students that are coming into higher education environments are getting a good deal. And one of the basic things was we started to modularize curriculum so we can start to look at it in a way and we start to create curriculum frameworks and the kind of the main structure of these things and this has ended up being a kind of global thing is that you can say all right if we're going to internationalize education so we're going to have not just uk people doing our courses we're going to have people from all over the world they need to be standardized in a way that allows someone to do maybe a sandwich course where you can go and do a year in America and a year in the UK or a year in France and a year in Germany. So we've ended up in a kind of curriculum framework that is almost global. There is almost a structure that we all agree on across the world as ways in which we talk about course structure. And that is what this is. Most master's courses are structured as roughly 180 credits, which is so... Yeah, you'll have a set of modules that jump to these chunks and you break them down. And normally the kind of structure is you'll have six smaller courses, just done quite 280, but in there there's a bunch of units. This is where I've got to so far. There's going to be in our course six modules, which are what you would call the taught component of the course. 
and I'm framing these as we're going to have six little units that will run roughly in our program structure throughout the year and a 60 credit research unit, which is basically a more autonomous thing. So this is your dissertation, right? So these, hopefully, if we do this right, and I validate many courses like this, it will be designed, I would pass it if I was sitting on a, a review committee. And normally you would get other academics from across different courses to also say, yeah, that's at the right level for master's courses. And this meets the various standards and that's what we're aiming for. It is possible one day that a DAO will have degree awarding powers. That is, people who have studied and have done a course, which means that is an official master's course. And you can go and get a job with it, and it would be recognized by employers. And actually, that's where I'd love us to get to. A course run by a DAO that is officially recognized as an as a official master's course. So that's what we're aiming for. So why master's level? Why not do an undergraduate level? For one, master's courses can be done in a year. They're not. Undergraduate courses are like three-year study courses, generally. Two, master's courses is what I know best. And in order to, I would conceptualize the, the, the study or the field discipline of Dow leadership to be something that you would need to be trained at master's level in order to be really competent at. So yeah, it'd be great if we had more accessible courses coming in from like undergraduate level upwards, but this is what I think is probably the most deliverable in a short period of time. So I'm anticipating that we'll start this maybe in January, like in a, literally in a few weeks, and it will run for a year. And the, essentially, our first cohort will have done something equivalent to a master's degree by the end of the year. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. So I, I would be, so typically how a curriculum would be structured is there's a, a course leader is responsible for the delivery and execution of the curriculum. I won't necessarily teach it all, but the course leader's responsibility is to find who those teachers are. So when I get into the sort of meat of this, there's a couple of the units I'm looking at. So, for example, I'm looking at UV to be delivering one of the courses. And I anticipate that I will be constantly on the lookout for people across the crypto space to come in and get involved in the teaching and assessment. So I'm not going to teach it all, but I will be responsible for the delivery of it. Does that make sense? It seems like a very good framework to invite thought leaders. Yes. Because right now it's almost like when you invite people to Twitter spaces, you, you you get like amazing content, but then again, it's also a bit, it can be a bit chilly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Look, look, there's a reason I'm doing this and I've got a sort of a rationale, some of the rationale at the end of this sort of presentation for why we're doing it. I'm doing this and pretty much everything I do is to boost the exposure and future sustainability of finance.vote. Um, not doing this for you know, shits and giggles. It's for it's because I think it's going to be an exceptionally good thing for us to do as a DAO. And I want to be able to go and approach the smartest people in the space and ask them if they want to help get involved in, in the course. Absolutely. No. So the conventional, so sometimes you will have two units running at once. So you would expect you would expect people so there's different ways of doing this. this is one of the things I think we should get in at the end of this conversation, because we're, we're going to have a couple of exceptionally challenging things to get over. Typical delivery for a master's course, and master's courses, again, one, another reason why to target master's is they're normally quite flexible in their arrangements. So I would say that we'll run these in sequence, one after the other. So we'll do maybe three to four week courses, it'll be quite intense. So it'll be like this one break, this one break, this one break. And you'll do that for like one a month, probably. A month for each one with a bit of a break in between. And then there's a extended period of time, three to four months for the dissertation period. So yeah, I don't think we're going to get into parallel. You can run them in parallel. So typically you would get people doing this in a term, then this, so they're doing two units at once. 
what I suggest the best thing we would do is do them one after the other. You can all do, also do, which we might want to explore, is something called intensive modes of delivery, which is that you, everyone agrees to find three days where we just do nothing but that for three days. I, used, I ran a course for about four years in Abu Dhabi where I would fly on a plane. So I've delivered a master's course for people. It was over two years instead of one. But I would fly on a plane 12 times a year to go over and do a weekend course and we'd do it in a weekend, and we'd do Saturday, Sunday, and then I'd go in next month and do Saturday, Sunday, and that's like intensive modes of delivery. So there's different ways we can deliver it. The other thing is that people will might discover this and find out about it three or four months in. So how do we build the processes around catching people up so we can start it, and then people who discover us in April can even catch up to the cohort running in. And so there's a bunch of different bunch of interesting things we're going to have to solve how to do. So yeah, that's, this is the standard curriculum structure. What I've put in here, this is what's called the FHEQ Framework for Higher Education Qualifications. And this tells you what level of study you're looking at at Masters. And there's some like critical words in here, which are things like critical awareness, so master's degree is it's above undergraduate and undergraduate you're learning about a discipline and by the time you're getting at master's level you're starting to create that discipline you're not just learning about a thing you're moving that thing forward so you're not just learning from everything that's happened in the past you're like at the edge of the field. You found the edges of the discipline. Now, DAO leadership is such a new discipline that there's only edges, right? There's no history of things that have happened before. There is only what's happening now. So this is an entirely, this is a course that would never exist in a, it w isn't existing in any universities right now because it's not an established discipline. Things like this systematic understanding of knowledge is like you understand what's happened in that discipline so far. Now, there isn't much of this in Tao leadership. And you can see current problems, new insights. It's like you're at the, you're not just learning about a discipline, you're learning about what the current issues are of that discipline. It's implicitly about professional practice. And what that means is it's like how it's put into reality in the field. So when you're an undergraduate, you're just learning the basics about what's going on in, so let's say you're doing a degree in accountancy or something, an undergraduate in accountancy. You would learn all these things from historic case studies. Whereas at master's level, you would be looking at current issues in accounting, right? So it's slightly different. So that's what's happening at um, master's level. The other thing is, it's implicitly about research and scholarship. So it's not just you're absorbing the kind of information that has already existed, you're developing the techniques to be able to find out yourself what's happening in the field. It's a research driven enterprise, right? It's a, it's a research focused thing. It's also about application of knowledge and practical understanding. So you're not learning just what's happened from books, you're doing it in practice. And there's this really important notion of criticality, which is you're not just taking things as read, you are evaluating the notion of truth in that discipline. What is true? I'm not just accepting that there is a truth, I'm evaluating what the truth is. And then it's, a lot of it's about understanding complexity, creativity. It's, and if, if any of you have done an undergraduate degree, but not a master's, it's that movement into actually creating stuff yourself. You're not just taking knowledge from other people, you're actually creating new knowledge in that discipline. Which again, I think this is a brilliant framework, a brilliant discipline to do that in because everything is new. The, the only way you can learn this discipline is by creating in it. So it's like, it's like an implicitly master's level discipline, if that makes sense. Any questions about the leveling? So level seven, level six is like 
third year undergraduate, level five is second year undergraduate, level four is first year undergraduate. Level one, two, three is like school. Level three is what we would call A-levels in the, in the UK. Everyone with me so far? Cool. So that's basically like the basics of curriculum design. You need to understand with what's the scope of this thing. So why are we doing it? I'm, DAOs are both a technical and human problem. So there is about to be a, the birth of a new kind of organizational paradigm. And there are, there's an acute need for leaders in that space. So the, there's gonna, there needs to be a, a group of people who understand what's going on competently enough to allow DAOs, to stop DAOs blowing up on the launch pad, right? Anyone can look, it's going to, like next year, anyone's going to be able to launch a token, an NFT, and set up a vote, right? There's going to be, setting up a DAO is going to be a one-click deal. Any clowns will be able to set up a DAO next year. The thing that will delineate whether a DAO makes it past its first three months or year is whether they have people who know what they're doing and can lead that DAO and its people into a, a successful, sustainable enterprise. So I'm doing this because I want, I want, to, I want us to be positioned in creating these leaders of Web3. And primarily I'm doing this for the FVT DAO. I want us to be a leader full organization. I want many leaders inside our DAO who can, if they want to, go off and work for other DAOs. I broadly want to see the DAO wave happen, not just for us, but for everyone. So leadership and what, what it is, I want, I'm doing this both for us and for the wider space. And almost rather selfishly, I want, I'm creating it because I want to negotiate what DAO leadership is out in the open. I don't know what DAO leadership is yet. The best way to learn is teach. So because I will have to teach this next year, and I will have to put thousands of hours into this, I will have to define what DAO leadership is and, and stick that out there. So I want a lot of DAO leaders, and we're going to be incubating DAOs we're going to be launching DAOs out into the world, and I want those DAOs to succeed. And what I think we're going to need is DAO leaders to do it. So it might be that we partner with some super cool project that wants to launch a DAO, and we say, we've got a team of DAO leaders here who can join you for a little bit, and they just go off with that DAO and help them succeed. Yeah, and then I want us, there's going to be some people who are going to be at the forefront of this, of the DAO wave. I want the people, I want our DAO to be at the leading edge of this. And I think the way that we do that is by having people with us who understand it better than anyone. So I want us to create the leaders of the DAO wave. I, nothing would make me happier than the people that go off and become industry leaders started with us. I want, I want people to succeed in this space. I want people to leave their jobs and set up a DAO. I want people to become successful in crypto. I want to create opportunities for people that they might not have what in whatever job they're doing or in whatever location they're doing. And yeah, like I said earlier, the thing that I'm, one of the things I'm most passionate about is education. And I want, to, want us to share that. And I think education creates opportunities. It's the great leveler. You can be in any context and the thing that can change your context and improve your future is education. And yeah, I think it's, it's going to be important for, to do that. I also think if we do it, we will create a set of learning materials that will be open source. By doing this, at the end of it, we'll have a bank of materials that will not only support the adoption of our ecosystem, but crypto generally. There's, there's, there are some great educational resources out there in crypto, but they're not well structured. It's all over the place. So a set of structured learning materials that anyone can pick up now and in 10 years time is going to be an exceptionally value value add thing for the space to do any thoughts on that so far are these good aims is that a good reason to do this 
Hi. Yeah, I think this is really inspiring. It really speaks to me. Being part of something, you talk so much about changing the world, and this is like real action, real things that you can just put some time into. You know, it's like you move away from this place of how can I help to here are real things that you could be doing. Take the course, become a DAO leader, be part of the change. I think it's really. I have a question. What I see that is positive and maybe negative thing, but something that we probably will face is that because in crypto there is a lot of war for attention. We we could we might potentially have like thought leaders who have their own DAOs and their own technology. That I'm just wondering, did, did you think about how to? It, it's a bit like when corporations start like um, sponsoring education and stuff like that. It can be good, like here in Germany. I think there are a lot of industry building like cool innovation spaces with like crazy 3D printers and all this stuff. So I'm thinking, and, and then I've seen that before in crypto, for instance, there was this one of the first courses that where people built dApps. Yeah. It was all, all in all, like all in through sponsored by companies, maybe even DAOs. And I'm not quite sure where I am in this. It, it shouldn't be a complete shield platform, but yeah, it to a certain extent it will be because all the cool people have their own project. Yes, That's a, it, it's like how biased, it will be biased towards our ecosystem. There's no doubt about that. Mainly because we'll be using our own technologies and our own ecosystem to do the teaching, to explain these things. The assessments will be focused on contributing to our ecosystem, for example. In some cases, I want it to be as agnostic as possible. I think maybe we'll d dive into the content a little bit and I'll see if, I, I'm mindful of what you're talking about, and I know what I know. The courses that you're talking, like some of the courses that you might be talking about, there's always an angle, right? I think as long as we're open about what our angle is, and to be as not agnostic as possible when it comes to this, it's okay to use what I mean. It's I find it pretty okay to be biased towards our own ecosystem because, like, we know it and we built it. So it, it, I'm thinking if we have like teacher, guest teachers, tutors, yeah. mentors. Then they will come with their own platforms, obviously. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I'll, what I'll do is I'll jump into the. What I'm Nick, do is... while you're jumping there, just one thing very quick. The thing yep. that I've been leading about the, the new changes to Discord and everything, Nick, is uh, the sort of GCSEA level of crypto, and maybe having this process going from GCSE to masters actually is a really good sales point. Yeah. It's a differentiator so i don't know if we should be involving you more in that to make sure that the sort of resources we're creating are at a certain level that can just easily allow people to continue to go forward yeah we need to so I'll, 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 when we get to the end of this I'll, I'll sort of share some ideas on how we might not just be a master's course provide routes into for many people right so normally when you do a master's course at a university, you need to have an undergraduate degree in that discipline. So if you're doing a master's in accountancy, you need a bachelor's in some mathematical discipline related to accountancy or something like it, right? You have to hear, this will be open to anyone, whether they've got an undergraduate degree or not, or a ma like there's, there's no, so there is necessarily going to have to be, it needs to be as accessible as possible. And what I anticipate the out part of the leadership job of the participants of this course will be go out to the wider community and try out their leadership skills and their educational skills. Can you go and lead? Part of the job will be, can you go and on-ramp people into the crypto ecosystem? and Can you lead other people? So that's kind of part of the idea of it. So yeah, absolutely, I agree. So yeah, the first course I imagine is doing is and I think it is what I would call the foundational stuff. You need to understand blockchains to get this stuff. So we will do a course so everyone has that base level of understanding of how blockchains work. So this will be quite a technical unit on understanding the basics of cryptography, understanding Bitcoin, understanding the legacy of the ecosystem, what I'm calling the story of crypto understanding how they work, how Bitcoin was the solution to the Byzantine's general problem, 
consensus mechanisms? What is proof of work? What is proof of state? What can blockchains not do is one of the most important things that almost no one got in 2017, which is why everything popped. Everyone was trying to do things that blockchains are not able to do. So I think you need to have this base level of understanding of what blockchains are before you can go on to do anything else, really. Do people agree with that? Any thoughts, comments on that unit? I agree with this because because I see a lot of it right now. There is like another wave of noobs coming in. And yeah. a lot of people, a lot of my friends are excited. And then I'm trying to like, trying to explain them basics. And they're like, fuck basics. I want to do this. And then I know that there will be this excitement will just go really, it will lead to disappointment. Yeah. So like for me, it's super hard because I'm not an educator. For me, it's super hard. Either I, I send them stuff they never read because it's too complex. And that even I don't understand, or I send them stuff that is too basic. And another interesting thing is that people tend to read a lot of mainstream articles straight away, like some yeah. Wired magazine wrote something about it or whatever. And usually you look at it, and a lot of this, this stuff is actually very bad quality because people who write it, they might be intelligent, but they don't get it either. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, yeah, I'm rambling here, but it seems to be like having a good balance, like to get these basics could be like super useful. So I, I can tell you what helped me. So I, what I, I think what happens, some of this stuff that's in this unit is what I would consider what's called the threshold concept. Very difficult to understand. And there's, I think about the things the the, I've been thinking about the things in this list for six or seven years longer even and i still find new ways of understanding them all of these things like some of this stuff is exceptionally difficult to understand and the best way to understand it is in a group of people trying to understand it you will find that through some dialogue through some interaction you can read some article on what is a consensus mechanism, what is proof of work. But until you do it synchronously with a group of people talking through, but I don't get it, people asking questions in, a, in an environment, it, the pennies will drop the more we talk about it. So we will just have ongoing conversations about what this stuff means. So yeah, the active learning sort of idea around this stuff i think will be important this is the kind of stuff where i think we can go to out to these other blockchains so, sorry just one one last in, intervention and i let you uh, talk yeah. recently i think raga and fabs like they are poster boy noobs in a way they started talking <laughs> about something that I, th I thought was a brilliant idea having a glossary right and yeah. then i realized that creating glossary is actually what we need because the glossary itself Without this frame of, of, of re reference, there will be just hollow definitions. Yeah. But the community uh, contributing to creating this glossary, that is actually a very useful process. Completely agree. And I, I think there's what I anticipate some of the assessments for this kind of work will be is go and convince, so go and teach someone else this stuff, right? So creating a glossary or an explanation of this stuff in your own words would be a good assessment for this. One of the things I would add to this slide is yep. that, especially for people that haven't lived these blockchain things, is maybe to have a history of the biggest failures of trying to force fit a yep. technology because it's cool to not. So these are the businesses that did it. This is the things they did wrong, and that's why it failed. Because for better or for worse, in six months' time, you're going to be trying to do this to a host of businesses that maybe yeah. have no idea, and they're just saying we must do it because it's the Vogue thing, and sometimes it's going to have to say no. And to yeah. arm people with the ability to say, look at this company here, look at what they did, look how it failed, look how much money was wasted and thrown in the bin, is going to yeah. be super important. I agree. That's what I was getting at with this limitations of blockchains bit. Maybe we can have even a guest speaker from some I I know quite a few wrecked projects <laughs> leaders, I think, and get some in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I completely agree. There's 
remember implicit to master's level is criticality. The reality of um, blockchains is that most things don't work. It's exceptionally difficult and such and such on the blockchain ideas are bad. I think we can go deep into the 2017 stuff and look at all the stuff that didn't work. All right, moving on to the next one. Next course is governance. And it's obviously implicit to the, the DAO idea. We'll get into some fundamental governance stuff. Starting with what is it? Governance itself is a difficult thing to design, to define. If you look up governance as a definition, it says the act of governing. And if you look up governing, it says governance, right? It's got this like very slippery definition. So we're going to negotiate that out, what it is. I think DAOs are closer to democracies than conventional organizations. So I think we're going to need some basic political philosophy some theoretical ideas from political philosophy. I think we're going to need to get into the practice of proposal formation and design. And at this time, we will be designing our own proposal system. So I'm going to synchronize this unit with the creation of proposal.vote. And we're going to be using it, dogfooding it during this during this course information architecture how do you structure information so that it can be passed and understood by the organization itself we need to do this stuff ourselves so we'll get deep into what is good practice in structuring information for people that will be part of the nature of this course voting and consensus formation as a governance paradigm is going to be important we'll get into some foundational organizational theory how organizations are designed and then we'll get into the limitations of token weighted voting and moving into nft governance and we'll be researching our own tech to understand what its value and limitations are thoughts sound like a good idea for a unit feel like it should be in there missing anything? i like the idea of having organizational theory in there because what i'm always afraid because i don't have this background is am i reinventing the wheel mm -hmm. because a lot of this like a, a lot of stuff people learn when they go into this governance theme they learn all this stuff for the first time and some of this stuff is really old yeah and also it's, yeah anyway I'm, somehow i'm rambling in, in the evening but yeah, yeah it, i mean it's a vast field we're not going to be able to get in too deep but yeah absolutely what it'll do is the goal is to stop people, yeah, reinventing the wheels, good way to put it. Let's get what... Even what like are these getting, get, getting like the, 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 some basic stuff that is actually old and can be used and reused and what is actually new. Yes. Like so, some people I hear like entering this space, they, they're pretty much like reinventing cooperatives and being like super excited about it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It is indeed somewhere later in this. Let's move on. We'll get to wait, wait. Good. Just before we move, one yep. of the key aspects of governance that turns people off, at least when I've started to speak about it, is that they perceive it as a super slow process. It's, yep. become, it's full of steps. And one of the things that I think is mandatory here is to make sure that people can see how it can be agile. How yeah. it can, it, it's not that we're going to take six months or every year, we're going to take a year to decide on the next budget of the U.S., but it's something that actually is functional, but was missing some of the key tools we just taught you. Because we didn't have a way of really representing it, etc. Now we can make this not only a really good way of representing, but a really agile process. Yeah, I agree. And essentially you have this, I've put that bucket as agility and process, which are actually in tension with one another. So this is almost like a dichotomy. The more process you have, the less agility you have. But there needs to be a balance. So, yeah, that's a really good addition. Thanks for that. By the way, this is... The issue that we discussed recently about really knowing the options. So we've been discussing about maybe we should have a debate on what the options really mean before a final vote can happen, which in real life I've never seen. Yes, absolutely. And, and all of this stuff will be lensed through the DAO thing. So. It will be how, if we're looking at political philosophy, how is it applied to the DAO space? How does this conventional organizational design stuff, how is that different in DAOs? 
And I think this is going to make it implicitly critical because we're going to have to, we're coming at it from the framing that none of this old stuff maps here natively. So we're going to have to um, be constantly looking at how it's modified and how it's different. Okay, moving on to the next one. This is going to be, and this might, because then you fall into a part of that bias side of things, but we're going to be pretty much focused on Ethereum on this one to start with, mainly because I think it's the it's almost like the sketchpad space. It's the most accessible space to get into smart contract design. We're going to learn about the Ethereum virtual machine. We'll understand smart contracts. I want people after they've done this to have, even with zero coding experience, at least understand Solidity development enough to be able to work in a team that's working on it. And optionally, if they want to, learn how to code one themselves. So I'm going to get UV to lead this unit. And he will, we will develop a zero to DAP course out of it where you'll be able to, with no coding experience, be able to get up to a basic DAP. And I'm going to get Naomi to lead half of this course on user experience, product design, and branding. And we're going to use our own DAPs as a case study and use it as a potential route into supporting users in theorizing their own. Good idea? Hello. Hello. I think you've glitched off there, mate. Push the talk. Yeah, the push the talk is a bit glitchy. Yeah. I was wondering if the coding part of the smart contracts should be mandatory after all these things that happened with smart contract abuse from developers because DAO leadership also carries responsibility for the smart contracts that rule the DAO. And mm -hmm. in my opinion, at least, a high-level DAO leader should be able to check himself if a contract is yes. buggy or could be exploited due to the responsibility that uh, he would be carrying in leading a team. I agree. And, and the notion of mandatoriness. So it's, I don't want this to be... So I struggled at the beginning of this of whether to call this an MSC. So typically you would say, is it an MSC or an MA? Masters of Arts or Masters of Science? And sometimes you can have two routes through a master's course, which is one is more MSC facing, one is more MA facing. It's potential that we've got both of these in here. And I don't want coding ability to be the blocker to people completing it. So I'm not sure it's mandatory. The, thing, um, the problem is with this is that, for instance, even if you learn how to write tests for smart contracts, right, like yeah. quality assurance, the problem is even a ver very good coder who can read smart contracts sometimes cannot write a good test. So it's almost yeah. like an infinite rabbit hole. So you can, of course, it's cool to be able to read a contract, but actually the thing is with smart contracts, they, they have infinite surface for attack. Yes. They're open in the open on this multi-user computer. Right, yeah. which is this thing. So you can like infinitely exploit it. So it's almost impossible to to train someone. I think as a DAO leader to be able to say, yeah, I can actually read this contract and say it's secure. Absolutely, it's not even how audit auditing companies work. Like auditing teams, they just say, yeah, we think it's a, they have these scales to say if you read an audit report before, you yeah. will see it. Exactly. Now. I've done a few of these DAP training courses. I can't write smart contracts like UV. I'll never be able to do that. I don't have the brain for it. I'm, I'm not able to think in this game theoretical adversarial environment at the EVM level. I can think of it in at the kind of token layer. And in a 15 credit unit, you're not going to be a competent smart contract developer at the end of it. It's just not going to happen. But what you can get to is to feel comfortable enough about the notion of smart contracts to be able to understand how to work with people who can de design them. And the ADAP is not just a smart contract, it's the whole layer on top of it. And, and Naomi will, is an absolute genius at understanding the product design layer of DAPs. And 
it is going to be as much about that as the smart contracts. But there will be an option. What I would hope from this unit is to give people a taste enough of it to be able to go, I want to do more of that, right? And that's where I want it to go to. Enough of an insight into smart contracts that you either find out if you can be a smart contract developer or not, and if you're interested in it, it might be the first time you've ever done in programming. It's just enough to build up what I put is computational thinking. Can you think, can you understand smart contracts enough to understand their position in the DAO, DAO environment? Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Nick. That uh, was actually what I was la trying to propose to have uh, some, a little bit of coding as mandatory, and then everybody could explore on his own how yeah. much he want to delve in this, as it's his personal responsibility. And of course, can never guarantee that you will be successful, but it can give you a route yeah. to train yourself to it. Absolutely. And I think we also I'm looking at this strategically of you will be able to if you do this course, you will be able to develop a basic gap as a thing that people would be interested in. Doing. That's what, one of the things a lot of people want to be able to think they'll be able to do. Right. I'll be able to start on DAP development. And there's a lot of great courses and we'll have quite a lot. It, it's been a goal internally. For us to develop finding very good solidity developers is exceptionally difficult in this space they've already been snapped up by the thousand other projects that have burst into life over the last year or they so, retired <laughs> or they've re or they've just become fantastically rich and now on a beach somewhere or building a citadel and yeah so it's a huge problem it's a huge bottleneck in the space so our approach so we've actually trained up three developers to be, who would, had never even touched Solidity before to be very competent Solidity developers. We've done that internally. So it's part of our process to build up a training sort of system to convert developers into smart contract developers. So this has an additional utility to our organization, which is UV's building the framework for a course of developing developers. So this has almost got a secondary impact of this is how we're going to scale our development function. Sorry, smart Sorry. developers. Yeah. I have a Carry son in. emergency. I'd love to contribute more. I have loads of ideas, but my son has an emergency. I have to leave. Sorry, no guys. We'll, we'll be recording it. Thanks for coming along. Um, go on, Ksenia. I just wanted to say we can convert smart developers into smart contract developers. Yes. That's a good Not time. very funny. Yes. <laughs> I like it. All right. Next up, token economics. This is the thing that really got me down the rabbit hole on crypto. The thing I've spent most time thinking about. I think there's, there's modern monetary theory, but I think we're I'm coining this new monetary theory, and I think it involves tokens. This is where the game theory comes in. This is where we talk about mechanism design. But it's also going to be about the critical function of treasury management in DAOs, looking at the, the heuristic of looking at the flow of money through a, a crypto system. It also involves things like behavioral economics, pricing psych psychology, and incentive engineering. What I want people to be able to do is to be able to critique, potentially even develop token economies after doing this unit. Thoughts, comments? So I, I think that'll be quite an attractive one for people. Yeah, we, we'll be able to do a critical analysis on Olympus down on this one. I think it'll be things to, to focus on. Maybe you should put Ponzi-nomics. It's going on. The other... Hi, everybody. First time I come online uh, speaking. This is hey. uh, Juan Patarroyo, JP. I'm out of Houston, Texas, a.k.a. Kitbash007. Nice. And... Um... The more I listen in, I've, I've been fi figuring out where I can fit in and uh, become more active in all of this. But the more I listen in, I keep coming to this idea of a university DAO. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that makes any sense to get started and perhaps to build it during the first course next year. Yeah. So university DAO is probably the thing that I wanted to do first in crypto because obviously I was in, in like, how do you take a university onto the blockchain? There will be a DAO for this. We are building a learning mini DAO for this. So, yeah, there will be. 
there will be a DAO that is responsible for running this course that I will be the DAO leader for with the view of not being the DAO leader on it forever. And yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm looking for DAO leaders to run a learning DAO. So yeah, you're right on the money. We, we, that's what we want to do. Since you added fun dynamics, maybe we should add FOMO dynamics as well. <laughs> FOMO dynamics. I think that's that is pon Ponzi dynamics, isn't it? Or is it like why not? This is yeah. It's Ponzi dynamics is I could do a lecture on Ponzi. We'll have to get. So I think Ponzi dynamics is STEM and FOMO dynamics is hu humanities, right? <laughs> yeah, I like it. Yeah, it's the. Yeah. If if I may add, we should probably have a view or perhaps initiate a discussion on the value transfer on blockchains. Because what I'm mm -hmm. looking at recently, perhaps lately, is uh, a lot of discussion from Bitcoin maximalists and some proof of work maximalists in general versus the proof of stake concerning energy costs, how value is transferred to the blockchain. And I'm yeah. looking more and more towards a view, not personally, I, I see other people having that, this view that having a proof of work with extremely high cost in equipment and energy is somehow magically transferring money inside a crypto asset, either Bitcoin or Ethereum, which I'm totally skeptical on this view. It's totally wrong. It's just they just didn't get what it's for. Yeah, and, uh, usually there are, con there are conservatives uh, that say, oh, work, uh, it's uh, proof of stake, it's so socialist notion. Yeah, um, so, sorry, I didn't mean to diverge, but I'm kind of thinking this idea of taking some value, like, I don't know, burning some energy and by that transferring this value into blockchain is just, it's, it's, <laughs> it's totally, it's, it's just, it's, they just didn't get it. It's, it's like not what it's about, I think. Yeah, I but know, anyway. I'm, I agree with you. I'm just trying to say that this is going to be a big uh, thing in the future. Perhaps initiate a discussion on how or add on the token economics, the value transfer or uh, the creation of value. And you mean and... so people don't fall into this trap of thinking about... Yeah, I, I'm energy. totally against That's... this trap. I really prefer that uh, money is not spent in uh, big uh, ASIC uh, chips and it's I... spent elsewhere. So I'll, I, I've thought a lot about this problem. And actually... I... Like I've loosely captured that in the, this crypto economics, which is it gets into the proof of stake, proof of work debate around value capture. I, I, there's the argument, there is an implicit notion of real world costliness, which is important of proof of work. And without it, there is this self-referentiality that comes in with proof of stake systems that I, I understand the arguments. I'm not against proof of work at all. I think there should be one proof of work chain. I think it's the only way to genuinely guarantee an uncensorable blockchain. So I think this is a, that's an interesting debate. And I think actually the framing for that session would be that debate, maybe. So um, how about the CPU vote that some private coins have? Perhaps not Moneros that has a pooling mechanism, but there are other private coins that have a proof of work, but they still maintain the one CPU, one vote with their algorithms. Yeah, you can roughly look at it's one computational step, one vote normally is what the way to look at it, computational iterations. But yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting discussion. I think we can maybe we'll get some Bitcoin maxis in to, to argue their cause for that one. But yeah, this is the unit to get deep into that argument, I think. Yes, that are like we want at least ten laser eyes in, involved in that. Yeah, we can have steak eyes with beef steak on the eyes. Beef steak. <laughs> it's because the steak are maximalist. I'm gonna get so next. We got two units left before we get into the dissertation. This is one specifically on DAO leadership, right? So this is where we get into the notion of. Um, we're gonna get into some fundamental theory on leadership and management classic leadership and management theory and pass through the DAO lens. How things change with pseudo-anonymity. Fundamental practices in decentralized work. What I'm calling community curation, which is Ksenia's expertise. Things like vibes as a thing. How do you create an environment that people are enjoying themselves in? Integrating feedback practices into DAO. Culture development. 
how do you build a culture within a DAO? How do you manage complexity? Which is an implicit notion of framing complex problems in a way that can take other people along with you. Values, principle, and ethos. What do they mean? And how can you build them into your DAO? And I think this one will have quite a bit of learning and teaching ideas into it. A big part of DAO leadership is going to be how do you educate people who are not crypto native and bring them into the DAO so that they have reached the threshold of understanding to be participants. And I also think there's a uniqueness that comes with working in digitally native spaces of which there's quite a bit of established research, but will again need to be modified for DAOs. We think yeah, it's great. So that's our, that's, we've I done. like the fact that it's almost, remember that me. That what? Sorry. Oh, have we lost Ksenia? You glitched out then, Ksenia. If, all right, because re-emerges. Yeah, so this is the way I'm framing that this is like the, sometimes called the capstone course, a cap, capstone module. It's the thing that all the work we've done through so far peaks at this kind of course, right? This is, we've got the fundamental knowledge that we need to be able to now critically talk about DAO leadership in particular. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's the, the synthesis course. It brings everything we've talked about together. And now we're lensing it back into the human dimension. How you be a DAO leader, what is it? And some of these things I think are important and we'll have to be quite agile with it because it will change over time. Finally, that every master's course will typically have a research methods course. So this is where you learn the tools to be able to do your dissertation. And I'm framing this around both. I'm just going to put this in explicitly, actually. No, it's, it's the thing you do just before your dissertation, typically. Yeah, it depends how we frame it. We can shuffle these around in ordering. But typically, you would do your research methods unit on the entrance into your dissertation. Sometimes things get a little bit tricky, and we might even do this, which is when we do the... Sometimes you will have, like, the dissertation over the summer. So if you were starting in January, you would do three units, dissertation in the middle, and then three units after, in which case you would front the research methods course in the first half. But sometimes you'll run this in parallel alongside it, but we can sort out sequencing. But this is understanding research. What is research? What is your lens on reality? The, how do we interpret reality? What is reality? How do we measure it? There's established toolkits for qualitative and quantitative research. I think implicitly because we're researching crypto, we're going to need to think about technology adoption and i think that's one of the principal things to understand in crypto but we'll also talk about ethics we might not be a validated course or an institution but i still want don't want people going off and doing unethical things in their research so we'll talk about that and fundamentally what i want people to be able to do after this unit is to go and be able to do due diligence on other projects is this a shit coin? And, and being able to understand what a good project and a bad project is. Make sense? Yeah. Really, this is a classic research methods unit. I've run these courses for, I must have taught 30 or 40 iterations of a research methods course at every level from first year undergraduate to PhD level. And it's just, it's a it's an important building block for master's level study because you, you need to know the tools to be able to go and go out and research stuff. How do you collect your data? How do you research? How do you interpret your data? How do you critically appraise the literature? How do you do a literature review? How do you go out and and, and importantly, what's your what's your epistemology? What what is the what do you think is measurable? What do you think reality is? It's quite like a philosophical unit. And once you've done that, you can then go on to a dissertation, which I'm thinking. I'm open to suggestions on this. Everyone has a shared research. Everyone has a, a shared question. How do you build a DAO? So this can have, I was three possible routes to doing it. One is a very theoretical one. You can go off and write about, do a very theoretical study in 
researching past DAOs using on data or something. And you could go and research governance proposals from across the space and find out what research proposals had the most effectiveness. You do a kind of theoretical review of DAOs so far. Or you can propose a new DAO through the medium of a white paper or even launch one yourself, that which would be the practice-based one. What do you think about that? No, everyone can do it individually, but we've all got the shared question of how do you build a DAO? So this is where you've got the basics, you've got the fundamental knowledge now. You go and essentially autonomously go off and design your... So typically in your research methods unit, you would be using this unit, you would decide what you're going to do in your dissertation and you would get support and feedback on that. And then you go and do it. And then this is three months of work. You go and you might go and get involved in a DAO, be a DAO leader with them, write about your experience, which would be the practice-based one. Or you've got your own DAO idea. You're going to write the basic, you're going to write a white paper for it. And that's what you would hand in, essentially. Or you can hand in essentially a classic 10,000 word essay on all that sort of stuff. My opinion would be, since we're in the edge of technology, yeah. I think the practice-based DAO is more important. Yeah. It could involve perhaps that uh, a student would go into an already established project and write and experiment on a feature of the DAO that she or he considers that it's not good or a feature that is uh, good. And he does a little experiment that he tries to influence people by being a leader. And then, okay, this DAO had uh, this problem and uh, these are the facts that happened with my interference and he writes a dissertation. Or he may find something very helpful and very positive about a DAO design. So he goes in, participates, influences a decision and say, okay, this mechanism is very right about this mechanism and uh, these facts happen with my involvement that leads to this, this and this. Yeah. That's exactly what I imagine the practice-based want to be. But I also anticipate there will be people who are coming into this course with their own DAO idea that they want to develop. And there's also going to be people who want to take that, the, the slightly more theoretician side. And yeah, I think that I agree with you, actually. I, I would love... So what I would imagine is that Someone like Lizzle, I don't know if she's here, but she might want to do her experience of setting up a data down, for example, as her practice-based thing. Or someone will be able to go off and, yeah, like you, exactly like you said, go and work with another DAO for three months and write about their experience. But yeah, exactly the thing that you've just described would be our path through this dissertation unit. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, it's very easy to join a DAO. You just click a few buttons. Yeah, it's, it's not like you have to go in a company and do a thesis no. from working in a company that it's non that it's in a local place. Uh, DAOs are non local. You just join. Yeah. actually join a chat. Exactly. So I supported. I must have um, been a supervisor on maybe 150 ed, like dissertations over the years from an undergraduate. Oh, if including undergraduate, it'll be thousands probably and yeah one of the biggest challenges is if on practice-based dissertations is oh you need to go and organize getting into some into a school or into an organization or you know this if you're doing like ethnographic style research it gets really difficult to organize whereas this you can go and just jump into a DAO on discord and you're in there's a real and the reason why i'm lending it into this how to build a DAO thing I'm imagining the portfolio, let's say we get 30 or 40 people doing this. The corpus of information that we will collect back, if everyone asking that question, will be absolutely invaluable. 40 different people equipped to do research on 40 different DAOs or 40 different lenses on building a DAO. That information will be incredibly valuable. Nick, if you yeah. take off your academic head for a moment, and you yes. think, what is the ideal outcome of this course? In my mind, I was understanding it to be, 
I want to the, the person who finishes this to be so competent yep. that they be consulting on 100 DAOs a week and, and have a pipeline of 10, 12 DAOs a week that they're forming. So like I said at the beginning, I've got actually, there's a few little bits here. I've got outcomes here, which we'll get into them. And you'll see where my head's at with that. But yeah, so if remember at the beginning, major goal for this, major aims is to build a community of DAO leaders and its DAO incubation plans. Those DAO's incubation plans, yeah, we want people to be able to support and consult on exactly what you just described. That's very much a goal of this. So I we, wonder if that means that the dissertation is very much that. Yeah. The aspect of it. Oh, by, the time, by the time people are doing their dissertations on this, I... I I want. I think we will DFET DAO be launching a DAO a week, if not more. So there will be DAOs being incubated by us or being supported by us, and a huge opportunity for just like people to just tag along with them and go and get involved. And yeah, by the time they've got to this dissertation level, they'll be one of the most qualified people in the world to be able to do it. Yeah, absolutely. That's a huge goal. That's why we're doing it. We want people with the competency internally to our DAO to be able to support other DAOs. So maybe another alternative is throughout the studying process, you almost create like a diary. In the first month, I'm helping yeah. A. In the second month, I'm B. In the third month, I'm B and, and C. And with everything I've learned in every month, how does that change the DAOs I've built? Yes. So assessment philosophy. I don't want people to have to be like, just constant, like going away and writing essays that get read and it's a proof of that they've written something and all that sort of stuff. I want it to be practice-based, right? So I want this to be, there will be loads of opportunities of emerging DAOs coming out of FVT DAO next year for people to be able to go and like just document, document their experience on it. So this is what you just described is what I would call a portfolio-driven approach that you would be keeping notes of your experience throughout the year in the DAO and using that as a documentary evidence of your engagement with this stuff. I'm calling it assessment for DAO. And so there's like assessment for learning is a thing. And assessment for DAO is the idea that the assessments that we do will be for the DAO. Like you'll be doing work that is that is helping our DAO out, whether it's ours or another one. There will be things that are out there that I'm not going to be able... We could end up with 50 or 100 people on this. I don't know. I'm not going to be able to market all myself. So it's going to come down... Some of it's going to come down to a peer review type approach where we're marking each other's work. I want it to be multimodal. There, there will be people who hate writing essays. So you'll be able to do this without writing an essay. You'll, like, you can do a video diary if you want. You'll be, be able to do art for some of it. Yeah, I think there's, there's I, I think exactly what you've described is exactly where my head was at with it. And Nick, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, hi. Oh, it's so annoying, yeah. I was exactly thinking the same of writing some sort of protocol while I'm doing the data DAO. Yeah. But my idea was also like this, this assessment you know, were talking about, maybe it would be nice that even before the end of the course, we would, like could come together and just exchange ideas and like talk about each other's assessment to learn. Yes. Absolutely. So that's very much where I'm going with this peer review thing. I want us, so the learning DAO or the mini DAO that we're going to create will be the space where we can all learn together. So I'd very, I don't want this to feel like an individual experience. We want the experience itself to be DAO, so we're all helping each other. This is the first run of a, first, of a course in a brand new discipline. I'm going to be learning it as much as you are. So yeah, absolutely. I, I want to build this culture of, that's why I'm calling participatory peer review. We're helping each other out on each other's assessments all the way through. Yeah, so curriculum philosophy. I want to find ways of getting our voting system into this. I think we can do votes on how much we're understanding the topics that we've covered. What are the things, use quadratic voting to say, these are the things I understand the least 
or understand the most. This is what I want the most support on. This is what I think is working and what not working. I want this to be very active in participation. And by that, the, a passive participant would be just someone who never says anything, just sits in the background and, and just knocks out the assessments at the end. And I think this has got to be ideally framed around, we're doing this, we're doing DAOs, we're not learning DAOs, we're doing it live. The other thing is we're going to pick up people who find out about us like halfway through. How do we find ways for people to, if we're on unit three here in April, May, something like that, how does someone catch up to us? And, and we're, we're going to be a cohort traveling through time with the goal of getting this done by this time next year. How can someone hop up, you know, really throw their, throw their hours in and, and catch up to the cohort as their midstream? Um, Going to be very challenging, but I'm interested in how we can do that. We can uh, assign uh, mini tutors. For example, yeah. students who had a 10 out of 10 assessment on the first uh, module, they can do yeah. asynchronous training in a private manner to the newcomers. So. Yeah. As you said earlier, uh, teaching is, bad, is the, the best way to learn something. So, for example, exactly. they can do like a secondary hours. They will have a fuller schedule, but they can teach the material to the newcomers. Yeah, exactly what I was thinking. That we, we, We'd be able to basically, as the first cohort are traveling through the, traveling through the system, they can help catch people up themselves. But do we want to catch up? Uh, sorry, was that five say again? Yeah, you can have a lot of parallel ones. There's no reason why you can't be starting a new round every three months. It's true. I, there's I've, I've ran courses like that. It can get it can get very messy. For one, it's yeah, just teaching resources. We've got to be very careful about. I'm all we're already burnt out this year. Running parallel delivery can get very messy. Uh, I think it's going to be. For one, we'll be using our catch-up methodology that we're already doing with the program. The program so far has been the practice training wheels for this, essentially. We'll have all the sessions recorded. Part of the assessments will be writing materials that catch people up. What I'm imagining is people can like essentially blast through all the YouTube videos, do the assessments, and catch up to us. It's a more sensible route than parallel delivery. Yeah. 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 This is where I was getting at with this. There's new pedagogy in here. There's new ways of doing. The reason why I got into quadratic voting was, to, was for this peer review. I had an idea I called proof of learning for a long time. I think, it's possible for, I think it's possible to use quadratic voting to get into grading. Well, I think we can certainly explore that territory. Huge if we crack it. So... Normally, you would write learning outcomes, and normally I would spend a lot longer writing them than I have done here. But the idea of these is that you say what the people will be able to do once they've done the course. So I want people to be able to critically evaluate and research blockchain and Web3 systems and propose and deliver paths for their improvement and evolution. So you will be able to due diligence a project and say, whether it what its strengths and weaknesses are and how it could be improved you'll be able to read a white paper and say ah there's one of the threats to it is this you should be able to do this and that's one of the things that i think people will have to do when supporting DAOs. lead others in a DAO context forming communities and decentralized governance processes so i want people to be able to not only to be able to walk into a community and help build that community, but help a DAO design its governance and say, okay, this is how you can improve your proposal practices. This is how you can build a proposal funnel. This is how you can stop those issues you've been having. This is how you do so on. You'll be able to set up or support others in setting up a DAO from bootstrap phase through to decentralized mature. If you wanted to, after this course, you will feel confident enough to go and set your own DAO up and go and lead a whole DAO yourself. Or 
support others in doing it. Finally, I would think it's you will be able to design a token economy and governance system and understand treasury management, understand token utility, and I've put in the construction of infinite games, which is a bit wild for a learning outcome. But how do you make sustainable DAOs that are not going to blow up in the future? So that is what I want people to be able to do once they've done it and successfully transition through it. Any thoughts? My first feeling is that this is too varied a desire for one individual. No, isn't it better for a group or at least to be able to do one of these and then as a group and then a couple of years down the line be able to take over? I don't know. It, it feels a bit like a lot of expectation. It's... A high expectation, for sure. I think it's doable. And I think it can actually be something, because it seems like it'll be unique to each person. And so you're really, you're making the DAO masters to begin to teach the DAO masters if this is going to be a way of life. So really, that's part of it. It's a group doing it together, but at the end of it, hopefully, let's say I could walk into this and then leave if it suited for me as the person's going to continue to educate those masters, because there is no course in this sort of at the moment. So that's what you're making. Yeah. And, and to the, the previous point, I think this one around, I'm not expecting everyone to be a token economics genius at the end of this, but critically evaluating blockchain systems and yeah, what we're creating is the next, it's, it, the idea is to generate a group of DAO leaders that makes more DAO leaders. Exactly that. Yeah. I think it's, the, the, we need this compounding growth of people who understand DAOs and can help other people understand DAOs. And yeah. There's this how question, and there is going to be a mini DAO that does this. There will be a structure within FET DAO that figures out how to do this as we're doing it. And one of the biggest questions is how do we do it without it killing me? <laughs> because this is going to be a lot. There is some question around, so how do we make it sustainable? One of those is, do we make people pay? I want in the first run, the first cohort at least, for it to be free, but there might be caps on it. There is a limit to the number of participants we had before it gets out of control and becomes too much work. But yeah, any thoughts on the how question? Yeah, there's got to be limits. And uh, what are we promising people? What happens if we get halfway through and realize that this is we bit off more than we can chew? What if what if it's too reliant on me? There's the, we, we've got to got to watch out for that you never know what's going to happen to me yeah i think that this is why i want it to be essentially that if it's free for the first year if it blows up then no one's lost any money i almost feel like it's it could be a, a group effort so the people who are enrolled in the course actually also helping to build the materials and curriculum is almost like everybody's working for this DAO. Yes, and the yes. work experience of this DAO is that you graduate at the end but we really yeah. were building it as we studying it at the same time. Exactly. That's exactly what I want. There's, I can't simply cannot do this on my own. No, so you will die. <laughs> there's, there's, there is, this has to be a massively group effort. I need other mentors from across the crypto space who have potentially more experience than me in this stuff. There are people out there, some of which I've already spoken to, I think there's key figures in the space. I think we can approach and say, look, we've got this session on consensus mechanisms. Would you like to come along and do it? I'm looking at people like Rafa, for example, today, who can definitely do some of this. There's, I've, I've, there's several people I've got in mind to be part of this with us. And I, I intend to invite many people involved in it. And yeah, when it comes to things like assessments, I'm not going to be able to mark them all. I'm not going to be able to create all the content. I just simply won't have enough time. But yeah, and again, it's like everything else we do. It's incredibly ambitious. But I think if we crack it, it's I think it could be very I think it'd be a huge value add for the space. And I think it is going to be the missing piece. We need the w the way to win in DAOs is with people. And we do need people we do need more DAO leaders. It's just that I can't get past the only way this works is if there's people, there's more people who can do this. So yeah, that's I totally that's agree. Um, that's, uh, that's the comment that I made earlier about university DAO, the mini DAO is that was my vision of how this could work and uh, make it that much more powerful. Absolutely, and we're doing the framework for this. It's a DAO, 
there are other people doing bits of learning DAO stuff. I think, yeah, we, I think we can lead the way a little bit on, on how this is done. It's, there's some things that don't map from the real world to DAOs, but I do think curriculum is one of the things that might. For structuring time, we're already doing it. The program format has been this emergent curriculum structure, basically. We're just going to keep doing that, and this becomes our program throughout the year. Anyone can dip in and out, but there will be people who stay in throughout the whole thing. And what does the final award look like? Typically, you would get a certificate at the end of this. Here, you'll probably get an NFT, maybe a one-of-one one NFT with your name on it or some identifier that you can prove yourself that it's you. But yeah, I would hope at the end of this that people are able to go and build a career in crypto if they wanted to. So anyway, it's been a long day. I'm going to let people stew on that. And yeah, I'm going to be fleshing this out over Christmas while I'm chilling out a little bit. And I'm anticipating we can start this early doors. I think we're going to need... I think it's an opportunity for us to get our name out there a little bit and i think there's going to be a recruitment phase let's call january recruitment month we start making the initial content and yeah how many people, people do you envisage that is the doable before you die because we bend the numbers from 20 to 100 yeah it depends really there's it's always been part of the path that i move more away from critical function of the project over time. We've got engineering mature enough now, nearly, that there's going to be more, and more, I'm going to be able to concentrate more and more on stuff like this. It depends, is the kind of answer, is that if it's all I do, I could take on 100 people. If I'm still... Because we don't want to kill you, then we should aim for no more than 50. <laughs> yeah, it depends, really. I don't know what the demand is. At the end of the day, What's going to happen here is, so one thing that's, like I said earlier, it's a bit more like a MOOC than a classically on rolled on course. And attrition rates on MOOCs are something like 98%. If we pick up 500 people, five might get to the end. It's like, the, it depends, because it's different than a MOOC. There's, there's going to be much more mutual support. I would hope if we... People always have grander ambitions when it comes to learning. When it's like part-time learning, you're juggling alongside other stuff. There's going to be a lot of dropouts on the way. So part of me just thinks, let's pick up as many people as we can. But what we'll have to do is just watch the assessment load and see how, how things go. But yeah, I'm tempted to just say, let's get as many people as we can and see where we get with it. Rightio, everyone. I think it's time for me to go home. So I'm going to sign off here. But thanks very much for listening, everyone. I hope you found that interesting. And yeah, let me know in the general channel or whatever if you're interested in doing this. So this is an airdrop course. An airdrop course. As soon as it's free, it's like an airdrop, maybe. Learning airdrop or knowledge drop. <laughs> hey. Drop some knowledge. Yeah, no worries, no worries, no worries. All right, everyone. Uh, good night, all. I'll, thanks. Uh, good night. See you around tomorrow. Thank you.